This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Joining us now on Zoom is Randall Horton, professor of English at University of New Haven. His new book is called Dead Weight, a memoir in essays. It reveals the lifelong effects of one man's incarceration on his psyche, his memories, and his daily experience living in American society. Dead Weight chronicles the improbable turnaround of a former drug smuggler who, after being sentenced to eight years in state prison, returned to society to earn a PhD in creative writing. And he became the only tenured professor in the U.S. with seven felony convictions. Randall, welcome to our show. Uh, Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, Randall, in your book, you pose this question, how does a person negotiate the dead weight that attaches itself to the body after being discharged from prison? Your essays focus on that question and also reflect back on your life before and after incarceration. Before we get into all that, can you tell us a little bit about your life growing up in Birmingham and what it was like growing up there? You started your life as a premature infant in one of your essays. You detail that for readers. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I do. Um, uh, that sort of begins the book, um, having this um, conversation with Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man on 155th and Riverside. Uh, just for context, the first chapter is called The Protagonist and Somebody Else's Melodrama. And what that means is that I'm looking at, um, thinking about the novel of Ralph, uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, The Protagonist, and the ways in which he became an unsuspecting character in somebody else's melodrama. Um, in other words, you know, you try to live your life one way, but then you understand that these that there's these other things that are sort of happening beyond your control, and you don't necessarily understand them until you get older, you get wiser. Um, and so I grew up in I, I was I was born in Birmingham, and and, and from the beginning, I like to think um, that. Um, I was confronted with a lot of things that uh, that that are that are, that are, uh, that are happening in this country in terms of race and race relation. You know, the sort of this whole thing. I I was born premature, and um, I had to be um, I had to be sent up. I had to be sent to a makeshift. Uh, I had to be sent to a, a white all white uh, NATO unit uh, after I was born, and this doctor saved my life. Um, and they didn't have because it was segregated. You got to realize this is 1961, and they had these ordinances that, or that you know, black and white people, children could not um, mix. And um, they sent me, but they, but they miraculously sent me into this all-white baby ward, in which I was able to get into an incubator. Um, but what happened was my mother was not able to um, see me, so she had a baby, but she really didn't have one because she didn't, she hadn't seen it. Um, and she was not able to see me until like I got to be five pounds, which was like 11 days. And so mm-hmm. um, it, so it, it begins there. Um, and then you, you pivot toward um, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church when I was two. And we were eight blocks from um, we lived eight blocks from um, the church. Um, and so. There's a lot going on in Birmingham, but 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 on the flip side, Birmingham for me was a very idyllic place too. I love Birmingham. I think a lot of times Birmingham gets this Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama gets this this sort of reputation because of you know the incidents of racism, you know, and and I understand some of that, but you know I haven't lived not in one city in which I can go outside and see you know you know racism everywhere. So for me, I find it kind of interesting when people make those analogies like, oh, you're from Birmingham. Like, what does that mean? Like, what, what does it mean where you grew up and you don't see the racism that's affecting you every day? So that becomes interesting as well. But, you know, getting back to me, um, you know, Birmingham is my nexus and sort of where I grew up and in um, and, um, and where I became to have what they call the James Baldwin moment. Um, I call it a James Baldwin moment when you realize that that race is a factor in this world and that there's no way that you can turn your eye to it if you have a moral compass. I guess you can, but you know, I think moral compass is, is the key to that. I think my grandmother um, was probably more um, responsible for like teaching me and, 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 and let me understand, you know, you know, my, you know, the things that I'm going to face as a, as a black man growing up in America. I think she was very clear on that. Uh, I spent a lot of time with her growing up because both of my parents were working. They were teachers and uh, I didn't have a babysitter. My grandmother was my babysitter. And so she began to take charge of, of my life in a lot of ways. And 
she guided me in a lot of ways. And I, I often wondered um, why she was being harder, hard on me. Um, but I think she, I knew she understood um, what I was going to have to face in this world. So um, not saying my parents weren't there. They, you know, they provided a great, um, you know, blueprint. I mean, in terms of I, both of my parents were teachers. My father was a teacher. He taught, um, he taught high school. Uh, my mother taught elementary school. So I come from, you know, I come from a family of educators. You know, my, one of my uncles was a principal, um, and and so there's there's you, my well, my grandmother's um, my grandmother's uncle. He was a principal, and so you know there is that. And so they, you know, so they, so I and, and more and so I look at it as a community uh, community job too, a community effort because you know I think you know as much as my parents gave me, other people gave me the same thing, and you know because I. You talk fondly about your mother as well. I enjoyed reading uh, the essay where you took her to D.C. for the inauguration of President Obama. What was that like well, for you to have your mother there? Well, let me back up. She took me, actually. <laughs> well, my mother, <laughs> no, my mother uh, at that time, she was the president of the Alabama Education Association and she was an NEA de delegate. Um, so she had been coming to D.C. for years through the uh, National Education Association. And every, you know, every presidential cycle, you know, she, you know, they would get these tickets to come to the presidential election. I don't think she went to one to um, to this one. Um, and, you know, I, I guess the beauty of it um, was that I was I wasn't incarcerated and I was getting my Ph.D. And I, I think she was she knew that I was on my way to trying to, you know, to do something positive with my life. And um, she invited me uh, to Washington, D.C. For, for Barack Obama's uh, uh, inauguration. And we got a chance to to um, hang out in D.C. Um, and we went to the inauguration, the reflecting pool. And, and it, it was just like an amazing experience and to experience that with the woman who had you know, probably been one of the most toughest on me as well. Um, you know, like she wasn't the traditional mother, like who would just like, you know, she was, she could be kind of tough, but it was a good tough and that she understood too, that, you know, what I was falling into, I, I needed that toughness. Um, and so I never, I never, you know, I, I understood it, but it, it meant a lot to be in that moment with my mom. Um, and that's what I'm saying. I didn't really realize until much later after we had, gone through this thing that it wasn't really about Obama and his election and all of that, you know, as much as I was excited to be there um, and go to the you know, States dinner and you got a chance to see, you know, Obama and Michelle dancing and and be, you know, part of like history. But it wasn't really about that. It was about me and my mother reconciling all of the things that we, you know, um, you know, had gone through all those years um, and, you know, coming to a place, you know, where we, you know, we were able to sort of share that love in a certain kind of way, you know? Um, and so for me, it, that's what it was. You know? so. You're hearing Randall Horton here on Where We Live, professor of English at the University of New Haven. We're talking about his new book, Dead Weight, a memoir in essays. So uh, when you were growing up in Birmingham, you also write about an incident that happened to you when you were in school. And I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that and how you started to understand uh, racism uh, as you grew up. When me, my mother, I guess I said she was a teacher um, and she was part of the first wave to integrate, even though integration had occurred much earlier. Birmingham did not integrate until almost 73. And so um, I, I went with her. Uh, one of the teachers requested her because she was a, a fantastic teacher um, and won her at his school. And so um, she we came and I began, you know, to have this other experience. And quickly I realized that, you know, because they necessarily hadn't necessarily talked to me about race in that kind of way, you know. Um, and they, I knew that there, I knew, I knew that there was black and white, but I didn't really understand the idea of hatred until I went to, until I went to that school. And you know, I had to be, and I would soon later after thereafter would be called the N word like every day. I would go walk down the hill to my mother's school and be called the N word. They would throw rocks at me, all kind of things. So you know. That's my conditioning to like this whole idea of like, oh, everybody, we're not in this together. And then there was a moment uh, we were on the playground. I had a, a white kid that was one of my best friends, Michael Hallmark at the time. And um, 
we were throwing the football around. The football, anyway, if the football hit a girl, uh, they were jumping rope. They were playing. They were, they were jumping rope. So I bent to go. I went to go retrieve the ball and didn't think nothing about it. And as soon as I did, man, she called me the N word and she kicked me hard. Man, it was like wow. And so you know, my mother told me, "Don't let nobody call you that. Don't let nobody hit you. They do. You hit them back." So I hit her back. You know, and it was like one of those things, man. Um, you know, and so she st- it, it was just it was just ugly, you know. Uh, it was ugly. It was an ugly time, and it was an ugly situation. Um, but I knew that I hadn't done anything wrong because my mother was one of those uh, um, mothers and teachers who believed who didn't believe in time out. Well, she wasn't a time out kind of mother. She was, you know, she 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 believed in discipline. And so I come from that generation where if, you, if your child lacking up, you should come into the classroom and and and, and, and put you in your place right there. So I, so you know, me as I'm in the, the the principal's office waiting for whatever's going to happen, you know, because there's a whole lot of commotion going on. And she comes in there, and she tells she tells the principal and everybody else that y'all better not lay one hand on him, don't touch him. So I knew then that what I did, you know, was larger than you know right then as, as a little as a little ten ten year old kid, however I was at the time, because uh, I was scared to death, you know, uh, about hitting a girl. I think that was the most important thing for me that I'd done something that that's the one thing that I'd been taught up until that point in my life that you never ever do. That's nothing that that's something that you don't do. And so for me, you know, it becomes one of those things like how, you know, like, like that's, that's messed up. And so the whole thing, you know, was really a whole, it, it was, it was just an ugly situation. Um, my dad had to come up to the school because he understood um you know what was going on and he understood how it could turn ugly in any minute so he actually went up came up there he talked to the team so the only thing you know the principal was a was a um progressive guy um you know some of the stuff i would come to know later right um but you know the parents was not happy trust me and he had to keep the peace so that's my introduction to race. And so like when the whole thing was over with, and by the time, you know, when, when, you know, when I went to school the next day, the teachers didn't want to talk about it. The students didn't say anything about it. And it's like, we lived so like everything, it's like something that didn't even exist. And so I told my, my mom and my dad, we had I mean, that first time I think I ever stood up to them. And I can remember clearly, I just told them I'm not going back to that school ever. So I got to find me somewhere else to go. So that's what they how did. How did they react to that, Randall? Well, they understood. They they got me, they found me somewhere else to go. They they wasn't gonna have me go there and just continue to be traumatized. I was a kid. How could I that they wasn't gonna let that happen? They didn't, you know, they didn't punish me, they didn't say I was wrong or whatever. You know. It's just one of the things that, you know, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, we we, we, nev- we never talked about it to pass that, I don't think. I mean, you know, except at, at least in my mind, I don't remember it that way, you know, so. But I know one thing, they never told me that I was wrong and that they had never really listened to me when I wanted to have, and you know, my voice. And that was the first time that they did and they listened, so. You write about that trauma. You... You say, true, you do become the thing to be hunted and treated like an animal. The trauma is difficult to remember and retell. The trauma of racism is what I'm referring to. Randall, can you talk more about how that impacted you as a 10-year-old and how you carried that with you? Well, I think it didn't necessarily impact me in the way that I felt a certain kind of way about society. Um, and, you know, like I went to, I left, I went to all-black school. Um, you got to realize I grew I grew up in in, um, in an era in which there were thirteen all black high schools um, is that 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 I, that I know of that I counted because uh, we were coming out of segregation. You got to understand that, um, and so I think as a ten year old I didn't I didn't know how to process I I couldn't process too much too much later, but for me I think it did it did it did affect me in terms of how I wanted how I wanted to interact with people and, and what I thought. Uh, it would be it would be years later till I could sort of get past that and go outside of that comfort zone of that which I understood, you know. So I left there. I went back to all black high school. I went to all black college. 
And even when I came back and went to all black college and got my MFA. And then I was like, okay, well, I need to step outside of myself. Um, not saying that I didn't have other friends or anything like that, but you know, the effect is real. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. I'm talking with Dr. Randall Horton today. He's professor of English at the University of New Haven about his new book, Dead Weight, a memoir and essays, where he reveals the lifelong effects of his incarceration on his psyche, his memories, and his daily experience living in American society. We'll be back after a short break. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Dr. Randall Horton, professor of English at University of New Haven. We're talking about his new book, Dead Weight, a memoir and essays. His book focuses on his story, serving time for seven felony convictions, and the lifelong effects of his incarceration on his psyche, his memories, and his daily experience living in American society. So you ended up cycling in and out of the system. So can you talk uh, more about this uh, as you are an adult, uh, describing to our listeners, you know, what happened? I've had, I had some minor scrapes with the law um, before I actually went into the system. Um, and the first time um, was in um, Fairfax County, uh, Virginia, and I, I was uh, arrested. Um, I think it was, it had to be like, I forget, it was 96, 7, about 97. Um, and um, I ended up spending 18 months in, in, in jail. I got three years, um, 18 months suspended. Um, and I had to serve um, time there in, in Arlington County as well. And so what happened was um, I, I was released and I got, went back out. And I went back to jail again in Fairfax County again, but I had multiple charges at this time. Um, so I had charges in Virginia and Maryland. So I spent another 16 months in Fairfax County. I went to Maryland and I bonded out and I went back doing, the, doing some of the same things I was doing. I skipped bond and I was on the run for like a year. So um, it's not, I just didn't go to jail. I, didn't, I just didn't show up. And I ended up getting caught um, in Maryland um, so I had a, you know, I had that pending case and I had the cases, um, that were, um, before me. Um, and so I, and that's what, you know, end up get you know, sending me to prison for a little time. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I, and I, I, that's where I actually, um, got into the jail addiction services, um, unit, uh, in Montgomery County, uh, jail, because I was trying to save some, I knew I was going to do some time because this was my, you know, I got, I had really got entangled into the system now, um, because I had all these pending charges in different counties and states and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, I can save some time off my sentence, but funny thing happened on the way to, you know, in that, in that program, it's not, a, you know, it's not a funny thing, but it is an interesting thing. I was like, for lack of a better word, in that I began to take, um, what we were doing in there serious, as in, I would be in the class, I would be, uh, it was a group session in which it was a um, social worker would come in and lead these, um, these group meetings. And they were always centered around essays that we had to write um and these essays would you know vary between uh, the harm you caused others or things that you had done in your life or it could be a million and one things and but the the thing about it was each one of them that i got was interesting and that i would go back in my cell and i would actually i begin to write about these things and as i began to write about them i began to feel a certain kind of way about being able to express myself on the page. Um, and I, I, I kind of liked what, liked what that was, where that was going with me because I, I felt as I was purging the stuff out that I was become a better human being. And it's kind of hard to say, but that's just actually what happened. Um, and, you know, I would read these essays in front of all of these men in this, in this circle, right? And who had been on, who'd been in a million and one places on the streets. And, you know, I would get their nod of approval and that I got it right or that they, or they appreciated, you know, me telling the story, that, those kind of stories that don't necessarily get to be told. And so I kind of took that to heart 
And when I got my time and was getting ready to go upstate, the lady, the counselor called me and her to her office. Um, and she asked me to make her one promise. And she said, promise me that you will never stop writing. Um, and no one had ever demanded that of me. Um, and so that's what I did. I didn't stop writing. Uh, I went from Montgomery County, Maryland to uh, Department of Corrections intake in Baltimore. And I was locked up for a whole week um, inside the cell. I couldn't get out and I wrote every day. And I said, I'm gonna start here. And I started there and I went to um, Roxbury and I began, I kept writing. And I worked on a story, short story, in which the protagonist was this little um, girl who was a poet. And I had no clue what a poet was at the time, uh, but I just equated poetry as something that was smart and that was a necessity. And I put those two together with this with this young protagonist girl that she was going through what she was going through with these projects, and she would like say these poems and you know to and everybody was like you know was looking at for her for inspiration. But I didn't know what a poem was, and so I had to kind of like work that out. <laughs> that was the part, and so. Um, yeah, and it sort of led to led me one way, and led me to a mentor that I, I wrote, uh, who became you know, Ethelbert Miller, one of the um, a poet from Washington D.C. who was at Howard University, um, and I could I consider a great mentor. Um, um, became one of the first uh, writers to that I, I corresponded with on the outside um, while I was at Roxbury, and so. Um, yeah, that's sort of how the journey sort of began um, from, I guess, from, you know, going to uh, getting caught up in all these charges and things um, and how I how I came into, I guess, writing in a certain kind of way um, and what that meant for me as I began to go through the system. You're the author of several poetry collections. Can you read one of your poems for us, Randall? <laughs> Sure. So it's 289128, Property of the State. Don't trust the process. Wait and waiting and wait. Naked, stand before God. You are now quite invisible. We're not materialized through iron nor the ignorant. Nothing changes nothing. Intake, property, medical, seize a piece of humanity, each destination, a moral point converging toward a cell hidden in the open by a lie. No one actually believes unless given the grand tour via hands cuffed to unbreakable plastic behind the back pull tight. No money, no phone call, no bail. Product for expenditure or process as prosecution for the good of the people. Dante and Donke, Duncan said, the most abused of an unrighteous order wrote the Soledad brother. Good people do not reside here. Screaming in a dark ocean, the body is not constitutional, becomes more effective than yelling, the setup ain't right. Yeah. yeah. And when, when did you write that poem, Randall? Tell us about that, that time when you put those words onto paper. Well, I was actually working on this collection then. I kind of had an idea of the ways in which I wanted to address certain themes. This one came much later, um, and I began to think about an incident in which I got um, arrested um, and sort of like, I wanted to walk you know, through that whole process of, of what it means um, to, you know, to go through the process. I mean, to go through, they say don't trust the process, the process of the criminal justice system sometimes can be interesting. Um, and um, just sort of give people a, a bird's eye view of like, you know, what all that means to one person going through the system, you know. That poem is in the collection 289128. That was your uh, your inmate number. When did you move beyond that identity? What was it like for you to transition uh, to the outside, Randall? It was interesting, uh, to say the least. Um, I think it was difficult for, for a time because I, I had to reconcile you know, the person I was to the person I wanted to be to where I was, you know what I mean, uh, in the present. And that could be around, you know, other people, other situations and things like that. Um, and I think for a long time or not for a long, for, for quite a few, for, for quite a few couple of years, 
um, I kind of was hesitant around people um, and even acknowledging uh, where I had been um, because um, I was going, I was, I was changing my life, but I still wasn't comfortable talking to myself. I didn't trust people. I didn't trust everybody. Um, and I didn't think everybody would understand what I, what it is that I'd gone through because I'm not a great miscarriage of justice. I am not someone who went to prison that as a juvenile for a mistake that he made as a kid, you know, the things I did were lifelong and they were deliberate, uh, to a certain extent. Um, and so I take full responsibilities for the action, but my narrative is a different kind of narrative. So my narrative is a lot of times is the one that you necessarily want to feel good about all the time. I'm not the feel good guy, but I do have a story to tell. I think at the end of it, it is a feel good story, but it is a lot to get through to get to that. I got to purge. I got to go through all of the stuff that I went through to get there, you, you know? And so... Mm -hmm. You know, my, you know, so my whole narrative is just a different kind of story, you know, and I have to I had to come to accept that, you know, um, and and once I begin to understand like other people, um, a good friend of mine, never forget, um, told me what, what made what, what it cleared it up for me. We were in Washington, D.C. Um, at a cook. He was cooking out one night and we were sitting down. I've been out of prison for about maybe a, a, year, a couple of years now. I was in grad school, oh, grad school trying to figure it out. And I was like, man, waste a whole lot of time. And he was like, man, just think about it. Um, you got you got the rest. You got all this time uh, to sort of do what you want to do with your life. A lot of people have already settled on what they want to be, what they're going to do, and it's and like they 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 just locked in. Now they're not going to do anything else. But you got the whole world. You can you can be you can sort of be anything you want to be right now. You can do anything you want to do. You know what I mean? You don't, you're not bound. You're not bogged down by like a mortgage for 15 years or this or that or whatever. You can literally draw yourself a new life. And that's what I did. I took that to heart and never forgot that. Can you talk more about the obstacles, though, that you did face? The fact that, you know, you wanted to go back uh, to get your education and how a university that you respected denied you because of your past. Um, yeah, I went to Howard, um, and, I, and I think, and I grad, I dropped out as a senior, um, which you know obviously wasn't a good move on my part, but that just shows you where how much I was caught up in the other life. Um, you know, I weighed the options, and you know, it just didn't look good for me on, as a, getting a degree. I was like, I'm going another route, and you know, and I. But at the same time, I grew up at Howard in terms of like I spent a lot of time that came of age there, and I really wanted to finish what I started there. Um, so when I, when I got when I, when I when I was finally released and came back to Washington and I had applied and I was getting ready to return as an old school return an old student returning, I got a I got a letter from Howard um, denying me entry, and so I had to go to University of the District of Columbia who welcomed me with open arms and so shout out to UDC I love y'all forever um, for doing that um, and yeah and so even. Um, I, and so even when I got, I got my PhD, um, I got a, my first year at New Haven was just a one year assignment. And, um, I, I got one in the job market and I got a, I got a position as a, a distinguished scholar in residence at Central State University, uh, which is the HBCU, right? Um, and two weeks before I'm getting ready to leave, uh, I get a registered letter from the provost um, denying, I mean, reject, I mean, renouncing my, uh, my offer, my hire, uh, rescinding the offer for my hire. So um, it can be interesting. And it's been interesting um, in terms of being rejected. I mean, other things I've been rejected for too, but those, you know, those kind of things stand out because they were both HBCUs. And, you know, sometimes I'm left to question like the purpose of HBCUs if they understand that, you know, in terms of numbers, in terms of black men in incarceration. And here I was, you know, this person, you know, trying to really do the right thing at this point in my life. Uh, I never, I didn't get a chance though. Um, so it is what it is and it was what it was, but it didn't stop me uh, from, you know, I think it only made me resolve in the fact that I had somebody that believed in me. And that's why I took that. And, I, and, and I, I made the best of it in that way, you know. 
the same time, uh, that sounds really frustrating that you that you had to go through that, Randall. And you know, when we talk to other individuals who are formerly incarcerated, you know, even though they have done their time and they have restarted their lives on the outside, they're constantly judged for the past. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about that um, from the perspective of your new book, Dead Weight. I don't necessarily know if I'm judged for my past now. I think after 20 something years, I mean, in the public eye, I am what I am because I think I have a public platform in a lot of ways and I I do a lot of advocacy. So my plight is a little bit different now. So I have to, I I own it. You know what I mean? So I refuse to give it the power. So I owned it. I claimed it. So I ran right toward it instead of like running against it. I think um, I I remember um, I had a mentor, Hakeem Adabuti. who I taught at Chicago State and was one, it was what you call one of the practitioners of the black arts movement, the architects of that, um, as uh, Don L. Lee he changed his name to Hakeem Adabuti. Um, and he, but anyway, um, it was like, you know, you run towards fear, to that which you don't understand or to which that you, you're most deeply afraid of and you address it right head on. So at some point I began to run towards like this whole thing. Like, I'm not going to let you shame me. I'm not going to be um, embarrassed about it. I'm saying, you know, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. All the, you know, and so I'm going, I'm, I'm, I am going to control, I'm, I am going to be the controller of my own narrative. And that's what I decided to do. Uh, control my, you know, be the controller of my own narrative and, 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 and let me and let people judge me for who I am, because, you know, a lot of times we have to, you know, we as people, formerly incarcerated people, returning citizens have to sort of like bleed our life on the page. But the other person doesn't have to do that. And they could be just as rotten as hell. You know what I mean? So I, I think <laughs> I, I think no, they can be. And so I find it to be, you know, I don't go I don't go for that anymore. Uh, that's what I'm saying. It took me a while. I wouldn't have felt that way coming out of and inca- coming right out of prison like that. I just wouldn't have. It took time to sort of have that kind of opinion and that sort of like resolve and understanding to understand like people are people, uh, you know. And so I don't, I'm not afraid to judge, lawyer. You, you can be whoever you want to be. You still got stuff. So you said it. It took you time though to get to this place. And so yeah. when you talk about your time incarcerated, you know, how do you do that with it with the students you have? You know, now you're a tenured professor at the <laughs> University of New Haven. What are the questions they ask you? Oh, they ask me everything. We talk about it. All the time. We talk about it all the time. I mean, because they're interested and they're curious, especially my criminal justice students. Um, you know, because I'm a composite of a professor that they couldn't believe existed. You know what I mean? Um, and that's the, that's the, but for me, it's, it's critical that they see me before they go out into the world and uh, practice criminal, whatever field they're gonna be in, criminal justice or policing. Um, it just is. I think they get a different understanding of like, A, you know, uh, what people go through. And then you know, sort of that idea of change is possible and what does change look like? You know what I mean? So um, I teach prison lit, um, and it's probably one of my most interesting and um, vibrant classes because in that class I can I'm, I'm you know I, I I'm allowed to, I, I'm not I, I bring myself into every class because I don't know how to do that I don't know how to separate the two I have to bring myself into the classroom and so but prison lit I, I can tell them a little bit extra stories I can be I can bring a little bit more of myself in there we can have these sort of grand conversations about what it means to go to put what it means to be entangled in the system or what does the system mean to society as a whole what about rehabilitation and restorative justice uh, you know so we can go through all these models we can sort of we can we can envision the world we want to see and talk about it in those ways and i i like that um and but every class whether it's english composition african-american lit intro to creative writing I'm going to bring in my stuff at some point because this is what I do. I mean, I can't, I don't know how to teach without that. Um, and they're going to know who I am. A lot of times, you know, they'll, 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 the students will tell them or their mom will look me up and, you know, I've heard students say, my mama, she looks you up. She said, you got to go, you got to go take a class with that professor, you know? And so, um, I've had all of those things. So, you know, in regards, it lets me know that I'm in the right place with, for that. Um, 
but with my students, like everything's everything's in play. I don't hold nothing back from them. Um, and in regard, I think they appreciate that because I can. I'm the, I'm, I'm the other. I'm the. I'm I'm a different kind of professor, right? I'm going to be that professor that's not the one that they used to. I'm going to operate a little bit different. I'm going to talk a little different. I'm going to have different stories, right? And so. I just give them another. I give them that kind of experience that they just probably won't ever get. My guest today is Dr. Randall Horton, professor of English at University of New Haven. His new book is Deadweight: A Memoir in Essays. More of a conversation after the break. You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Dr. Randall Horton, professor of English at University of New Haven, talking about his life, the focus of his new book, Deadweight, a memoir and essays. The book focuses on the lifelong effects of his incarceration, on his psyche, his memories, and his daily experience living in American society. Many of the essays in your book also talk about your life before you were incarcerated. At one point, you were a drug smuggler. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about, you know, why you decided to share these stories. Uh, You wrote uh, in your book, cocaine was something most of my friends did not and could not escape. Uh, And so I wanted to hear more about that, Randall. I don't have a problem. I didn't have a problem with it, but I think I think. So for me, I'm a writer, right? I'm, and I think we sometimes, you know, we get the, the, the two conflated. I'm not a p- prison poet. I'm not a prison writer. I am a writer. I write stories. I tell stories. I talk about things. I just happen to be able to tell this one pretty good. And so for me, like India, if you look at the, if the trajectory of my work, I didn't even start writing about incarceration to my fourth or fifth book. Because I understood how the people like to put you in these night niche boxes and stereotype you into one specific thing, um, which is why I try, I try to you know resist that you know all the time. And but you know, I, and when I'm addressing um, you know these things that affected my life and my life in some kind of way, I I had to come to um, you know being comfortable telling those stories. And I had to tell them in the time that I wanted to tell them. See, for me, I, it wasn't about getting out of prison and like writing a book and talking about, you know, oh, I was in prison, I got a book. I wasn't trying to do that because I'm a writer. And what, you know, after that book, what you just going to do? So, you know, if you look at the trajectory of my work, I've, I've really tried to, you know, you know, make a conscious decision to sort of like be very varied in what I do so I don't get pinned into like this one thing that people continuously try to do. So um, that's one thing. But to tell those stories, I, they were critical. They had to be told. They needed to be told. Um, because, you know, a lot of times these are the narratives that you, you don't necessarily get from writers in this kind of way. You, you just don't. Um, and the most of the time you get them from people who have lived the experience. But I don't know if they're writers or not. And I don't know if they wrote the book themselves. They have a ghostwriter or something. You know what I mean? And so for me, um, I need to be. I wanted to give you that experience, um, but I also felt compelled to write it. I mean, I'm not. I don't. I'm not interested in telling the story. I'm interested in writing the story. You know? uh, that leads me to my next question. Um, when you're very open about you know, these uh, moments in your life in the book Deadway, and I was wondering, you know, in the writing process for yourself, Randall, did mm-hmm. writing this help you forgive yourself for those moments you're not proud of? Yeah, I think so. But don't, but see, it's like memoir is interesting, man. It's like when you, when you're writing a memoir, it's like the process of forgiveness begins with reliving the event over and over again as you're writing it. And then you gotta, you gotta, you gotta edit it. And then you gotta go edit it again. And so the, so the read, so that becomes a process in which you become very familiar with that. And it's almost you slip into that world for a minute if you if you any kind of writer worth 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 their salt, um, you almost become the thing in which you forgot that you were. Sometimes, and so coming out of memoir can be kind of tricky too because you know it's like you got to try to decompress. But after you get past that, I mean, for me, you know, it's like a sense of like 
you know, another part of like telling some of my story. You know, I don't know how much freer, because I've been, you know, I've told my story. I've told, you know, I've, I've, for me, you know, when I've told my entire story to my parents and like everything that I went through, that was enough for me in terms of that. Because I went through a life they had, you know, they thought they knew, but they didn't really have a clue. You know what I mean? They thought, they really thought they knew because they, you know, I kind of included in on some of those things and they were around. But they literally did, did not know the depths into um, some of the things I had fallen into. So that's why I got free. I wanted to go back uh, just quickly to uh, that program that I believe changed your life, the one that you referenced uh, where you started to write. And yeah, when we yeah. hear about uh, uh, programs within uh, correctional facilities that might focus on uh, someone incarcerated uh, to focus on trades and skills so that they can secure a job uh, when they're released. Um, what do you think about you know, more programs like what you experienced where um, people who are incarcerated are encouraged to write? Well, I think, I mean, I... I... I um I think we need more of them. That program is kind of special to me. The lady who ran the program, uh, well, who runs it still, Bunny Boswell. She's um she's an iconic figure within Montgomery County. Um, um, and and Pat Parker, who was the lady who ran the um the group. Um, but um they work. Um, and I've seen them work firsthand. Um, in terms of that, and so um, for me, um. When I got the chance to 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 go back inside and sort of share some of that in that way, um, what was was in my PhD program, I was able to go to a facility called um, called Mount McGregor in Saratoga, uh, it's a state facility. They closed it down now, but I I, I was um, invited by another poet friend um, to go up to come there and do a reading. The people that were in um, Mount McGregor. There was a, they had they had they had a poetry reading like once a month, and they invited me as an outsider to come um, to read to them, and I never that was very special. I, I was in the chapel, um, and it was like probably three or four hundred people there, man, and I, and I read, and and then we had conversations after. And it was just a beautiful thing. And so after that, and so after then, I went to their workshops, uh, and I became and so I became, you know, just like you know, a fan of what uh, what was happening in that workshop. And so when I got my job in New Haven, I, I continued to come, you know, it's not that far. Uh, I would come at least once a month um, to, to, to work with those guys. Um, and and it was and they were doing then they were doing they were doing graduate level, you know, poetry stuff. Uh, I, you know, I teach on the graduate level, too. And and what they were doing would be would would make any would envy in any MFA student. But the the more important thing is this is like um, when that when when um, years later um, when most of those guys had gotten out um, uh, of their situation, I remained in contact with them, and um, one of the guys got married up in Long Island, and 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 we were there, and the guys who had been in that that workshop uh, for years, right, and they were out, and I just looked around and I realized that all of them were doing these amazing things as non writers. But they, they spent their time studying the word and studying language and studying literature and sort of, you know, just sort of like really analyzing, you know, maybe the world and themselves. It's something that's so, I, I, I don't even know if I can even explain it or put my hand on it, but I know I saw it. I know it's real. And it's like, I'm looking at like six or seven guys that's in the program and all of them were like, were doing like amazing things outside and making positive contributions. You know, M M you know, running, 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 running businesses with MBAs, nonprofit organizations doing amazing work, all kind of things just sort of like stem from, you know, what one can learn in a poetry workshop. <laughs> you know, I get that question a lot. Um, I'm actually, I don't know if you know, I'm doing a, I, I, the recipient of a Creative Capital uh, Award um, where we're going to, I'm going to put um, a recording studio and creative space in like three or four prisons uh, around the country. Uh, and I'm in the process of talking to, um, you know, um, the officials on the inside now. And that's one of the questions I get and it's about, like, you know, what, you know, what, what can one do with poetry? Or what can one do with language, uh, the arts? And, you know, because, and, and, you know, people want these sort of hard, 
outcomes, you know, like a, what can you need a job with and all. And I get I get it. But sometimes you got to work on the self, too. And you have to start from the inside out. And I think, you know, it, I think writing and language and the arts, you know, does that. Um, it, it, you know, it, it did it for me and I've seen it do it for other people. Um, and so that's where I, so I start with what I know. And I think, um, it's so, so that's something that, that that's something I definitely believe in. And I'm sort of like, even now, as I begin to sort of, we can begin to work on these projects, um, in like four, in like four prisons around the country. Um, you know, we, we that's what we have in mind and to give to give these people an experience to make them feel good about themselves, to have them doing things um, in which, you know, they did sort of develop a better consciousness, you know, um, and that's where it starts because you can't be you can't just switch to switch on and to change your life if you haven't changed on the inside. You know, it's like it would be like putting on new clothes. You didn't take a bath. Right. So. Well, I'd look forward to hearing more about that project that you described. Uh, Randall Horton, again, was my guest, uh, professor of English at University of New Haven. His new book is Deadweight, a memoir and essays. He's also author of several poetry collections and the memoir Hook. Randall, a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, so nice talking with you all. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show was produced by Tess Terrible. Special thanks to Eugene Amatruda. Check out our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live, to read an excerpt from Randall Horton's new book. Thanks for listening.